Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Karen, uh, and here with me today are speakers and colleagues from GovTech and URA. Uh, they've turned on their videos to say hi. Uh, so before we start, uh, we'd like to remind everyone uh, of the house rules that uh, we are showing on the screen now. Uh, Alex, if you could go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. We will post the link shortly after this. Uh, please mute your microphone and video when presenters are, uh, speakers are presenting. And in today's session, we ask that your questions raised be relevant to the topic shared by speakers. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A panel below instead of the chat to ensure that the speakers do not miss any questions out. So we have a lot of interesting content lined up today. Uh, in the interest of time, speakers will only address questions posed on the Q&A panel uh, after their presentation. So time has been allocated for a combined Q&A after all three speakers have presented uh, and addressed some of your questions. Uh, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. So we'll open up the floor for verbal questions during the combined Q&A session. If you'd like to ask any questions, kindly raise your hands in the Zoom function below. Uh, we'll call out your name and if you can unmute, uh, share your name, uh, share us where you're from and, and you, can, you may start speaking. So to allow us to take as many questions as possible, please keep your sharing to under two minutes. And finally, uh, we have a virtual networking session at the end. If you'd like to stay back and uh, network together with the speakers as well as the panelists, please feel free to do so. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. This is the program that we have lined up today. So we'll start with Dylan, who is uh, from GovTech's Data Science and AI Division, who will share us about uh, Vigilant Gantry. This followed by Jezreel, uh, our colleague from URA Digital Planning Lab, who will share about Space Out. And last but not uh, least, Chin and Xia Yi from GovTech Smart Nation and Platform Solutions will tell us more about Spot the Dog, as I'm sure many of you have seen in the news. So without further ado, may we invite uh, Dylan uh, to start, please. Dylan, please. Uh, thanks, Karen. Hi, guys. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the organizer for hosting us. Uh, we appreciate your hard work in organizing this event. So I'm privileged to be part of this uh, panel of distinguished speakers. Uh, hello, Chin. Hello, Jia Yi, and our friends from URA, uh, Jezio and Louis. I also saw Chong Wen in the chat. So uh, my name is Dylan, and I have with me Bill. Uh, both of us are from the Video Analytics uh, Department from the Data Science and Artific Artificial Intelligence Division of GovTech. I will take the next 15 minutes to share with you our project on Vigilant Gantry. Next slide, please. Yep, so as you may have understood from the invite description, Vigilant Gantry is an automated temperature screening a gantry that augments existing thermal systems that enhance contactless screening. So I guess what you want to find out from this sharing session are exactly the things that we did precisely to make Vigilant Gantry. You might ask, are we actually building the entire gantry by ourselves? Or is a Vigilant Gantry just a software? Or is it a mixture of a software and hardware? So throughout this whole presentation, I will bring you through uh, the journey of making a Vigilant Gantry as well as uh, where are the engineering efforts uh, lies. So, uh, so with me, uh, there's a picture of our, our team. So uh, it's not just uh, the engineers. Actually, we do have uh, quite a bit of uh, product management, uh, uh, stakeholder engagement. So to make this happen, uh, we actually need quite a bit of uh, help. From all this, and I'm very proud to be part of the team that uh, is able to actually pull this off uh, just within a couple of weeks. So, next slide, please. Here is the agenda of this sharing the problem statement, design and prototyping, field testing, industry adoption, and collaboration. So, next slide, please. So, uh, what do we observe? So after the announcement of DOSCON Orange and before the circuit breaker period, so we saw queue everywhere, especially during peak committing period, especially in com uh, commercial buildings. So according to a street time article, uh, people have to wait uh, in the hot sun for about 40 minutes. So next slide, please. So hence, uh, my team and I were curious of this issue and decided to delve deeper. Why are people actually waiting so long outside uh, the office? So we visited a dozen of commercial buildings and tried to understand the reason for the queue, specifically looking at uh, bottlenecks in terms of operation. So this is what we have discovered. So I'll orientate you guys on the illustration uh, in this slide. Okay, so uh, this is a floor plan of a typical building lobby and 
the manpower deployment by building owners. So uh, this is after the announcement of Gauscon Orange and before the circuit breaker period. So the one uh, is the person, if you can see the person, those, are, those that are bounded by red lines are the additional manpower required for uh, temperature screening. So as you can see, uh, after, with the implement of temperature screening, we do, have, we do need to have four uh, ground staff to be there all the time. So uh, on your left, you can see the door. And the floor marking sh uh, shows the direction of uh, where the visitor should go to enter the building. So uh, as you go in the door, actually, uh, this is what we usually see. You'll be greeted by a security officer who will direct you to the gantry to enter the building. So that security officer actually has uh, two jobs. So first is to do crowd control. And second is to remind visitors to remove their headdress and sunglasses. So that uh, when you go through the screening, uh, cam uh, the thermal camera, you'll be screened properly. So from our understanding from building owners, uh, even though you can put as many signs warning signs for people to remove their headdress or sunglasses, uh, people will still maybe forget. So, uh, so you do need people there. So as visitors walk past the reception, uh, there will be another ground staff which, de which is deployed often uh, looking at the thermal camera to monitor, monitor for febrile visitors. From our discussion with building owners, we understand that the ground staff will need to monitor the temperature the, actually the screen of the temp temperature screening uh, camera for up to six hours a shift. So you could imagine the work fatigue that they have to go through. So if the camera, if the thermal camera indicates a potential case of fever, the ground staff will have to attend to the suspected visitor and take a secondary temperature check using a thermal gun. Uh, so he has to do this type of uh, thing to deny him entry. So if the ground staff, ground staff is attending to one person, another potential febrile visitor might sleep through the crack and actually go past. Because the ground staff, uh, it's quite impossible to actually monitor the thermal screen and do crowd control and to stop people concurrently effectively. So in short, uh, we are looking at uh, each entry of each lane. We are looking at the minimum deployment of all ground staff. So hence, uh, actually, this is a big issue. Next slide, please. So to recap, uh, what we want to address. So long queue due to long waiting time and the manpower crunch uh, for building owners. So we believe that this issue will definitely resurface as we exit the circuit, circuit breaker. Next slide, please. So, uh, so what do we do? So when you look at the floor plan, uh, what can we do? So actually, when you look at carefully as what we have observed, uh, you have a gantry, you have a CCTV, and you have a thermal camera. So, oh, so there's, uh, three, there's actually three things that you can play with. So imagine this scenario, uh, a person covering his, uh, sorry, a, imagine this scenario, a thermal camera senses a febrile person and because the camera knows that the, the thermal camera senses him, the gantry will open. So another scenario is, uh, imagine a person covering himself, uh, passing by the thermal camera system, but the CCTV notice that, notice him and it won't open. And uh, not only that, a visual and audio alert can be sound to remind the person to remove his headdress or sunglasses. Hence, actually, that's the basic uh, idea of vigilant gantry. Uh. So we do have uh, equipment lying around. Why not just let the uh, equipment uh, communicate with each other? Next slide. So the basic idea of vigilant gantry is actually to make these existing devices uh, communicate with each other. Next slide. So uh, this is sort of like a smart home device that you can find uh, lying around. Uh, usually your smart home is uh, linked to a sensor as well as a uh, I.O. So uh, the, usually the smart home hub is actually intelligent enough to actually automate the I.O. operation for the benefit of the user using uh, intelligent sensors. Next slide. So uh, if we, we believe that uh, if we can control the three devices, uh, we actually could uh, solve two problems that we want to address. So as illustrated in the diagram, uh, the person in red, so people person uh, of, or is uh, if, he, if he's covering his faces with headdress or sunglasses, will not be granted uh, access so by our system. So, uh, so how, this is how the workflow. So when he cannot grant that, uh, grant, he cannot access, so naturally he will go to the reception. So actually you don't need, uh, we believe that you don't need additional deployment for manpower in this case. So in short, uh, the ground staff deployed can actually potentially take more on, um, take on supervisory uh, roles doing more important tasks such as attending to emergencies and answering queries by the visitors. 
So uh, for the visitors, uh, if we can make this system uh, fast, effective and seamless, actually there's no change in their uh, daily activity. Uh, so going through the gantry as per their uh, usual routine. Uh, next slide. So now we are very clear with the problem statement. We are able to come up with a sort of design principle uh, for our solution. So they are utilizing existing hardware, minimizing the instruction to existing processors, uh, adaptability, uh, accurate and performance. Next slide. So, uh, so this is the whole uh, system architecture of uh, vigilant gantry. Uh, let me orientate you guys on the diagram. So on the left are the sensors. So as you can see a camera, so these are off the shelf uh, optical camera that you can buy anywhere online today. And uh, we take in imagery from the thermal camera. So in the middle is where the vigilant gantry software lies, uh, running off a discrete GPU laptop. On the right are the display and the gantry. So back to the middle part, which is the vigilant gantry software. So vigilant gantry software actually consists of five modules, uh, all of which contains are uh, self-contained using Docker, of course. Uh, they are coordinated using a uh, Docker Compose. So you can think of it as a micro microservice. Each of them have their own endpoints uh, to communicate with each other. So for this quick prototype, we actually make use of uh, HTTP uh, post requests to communicate with each other. So one of the reasons uh, why we make sure that uh, we divide them into three or uh, five modules is to uh, make sure that it's modular so that actually can always swap out. Once uh, a module doesn't work well, actually we can swap out. So another reason is uh, it's easy for us to distribute the task. Uh, so my teammate, uh, Bill, and I actually uh, with this microservice way of doing things, uh, we are able to actually work independently and uh, and uh, come out this prototype quite fast. So I think this is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, the input from the IP cameras uh, via the RTSP uh, goes to the phase segmentation module. So the phase segmentation module uh, uses a couple of uh, deep learning models to quantify the amount of uh, exposed skin of a detected phase. So just to recap, uh, what we want is to make sure that people are not covered when they go past the uh, thermal scanning system. Because if they're covered, right, you can't, you can't have an accurate reading. So, uh, so what uh, our model does is to actually quantify the amount of uh, exposed skin of a detected face. So in other words, if a person is covering his face, for example, 50%, our model should uh, be able to indicate that it's covered 50%. So on the other hand, uh, there's a thermal images from the thermal camera that goes through a, a color segmentation module that we developed using traditional computer vision to look for red patches. So usually, uh, like any heat map, uh, red patches means uh, signs of high skin temperature. So, uh, so these two inputs fix into uh, the middleware. So the middleware does three things, uh, namely decide whether to open a gantry, uh, push information to the, uh, to the display so that the ground staff actually can have a look, and also push information to the database for logging purposes. So next slide. So uh, I'll go through uh, uh, the implementation details of each of the modules. So going into the details of the color segmentation modules, uh, so, uh, so uh, thermal, the thermal imagery uh, will come into our module. So we use a HSV color model as well as the block estimation to estimate the size of the red patch. So as illustrated in a diagram, uh, there's a red patch in the neck. So this is one of the calculus size of high skin temperature. So we are able to use computer vision to extract this and estimate the size. So, uh, so this size, we can actually compare with a certain threshold. Uh, then we will decide that whether it, it's really a fever case. So sometimes we have, you, does, uh, you do have a spot of uh, red patches on your skin, but doesn't mean you, you have fever. So, uh, so the amount of size is actually cal calibrated. So how are we able to do this calibration is, uh, we actually had a lot of technical discussion with the cam uh, thermal camera vendors. So I believe that, uh, so I, one of the thermal camera vendors, actually our oh, Google actually provided us videos for us to do the calibration. So we are very grateful with the help of the, the industries uh, supporting us with this, uh, answering our queries, because we are not expert of thermal camera, but uh, we, we do get a lot of help from them. So implementation wise, uh, we, we use the OpenCV Python because it was fast, uh, easy to prototype, and uh, at, at least for this stage uh, of the development cycle. So next slide. Uh, for the phase segmentation modules, uh, we actually use three deep learning models. 
So firstly, uh, we are using a person detection model. So we need a person detection model to ensure that uh, uh, we actually uh, perform space segmentation right on the appropriate person. So you don't you don't uh, like for example a scene that's ten person you don't like you don't you don't perform uh, every, on every person you perform the face segmentation only on the person that's going through the gantry. Hence, uh, we need a, a person detection a model. So when a person is detected, we estimate the centroid, uh, which is uh, illustrated in the red dot in the picture. So if the person centroid uh, uh, is within our re region of interest, so the face segmentation model will be triggered and estimate estimate the face exposure value. So from there, we are able to calculate how much exposed face uh, they have. So compute the, to compute the uh, face exposure uh, area percentage, we need to calculate the total uh, face area. Hence, we need a face detection and uh, followed by the face uh, segmentation, which is trained on faces. So the next slide will give you a better illustration of how it works. So, uh, so you can see the person, a, a red dot, he, he, there's, there's a red dot that uh, passes through our warning box, then the face person detection, uh, the face segmentation will be triggered. So you can see the green patches on his face. So that's the amount of exposure face, the, the exposure that he has. So if uh, they have a significant amount of exposure, we are confident that they are not covering. Hence, the temperature taking will be accurate. So some of the implementation, implementation detail is, uh, so, so it's deep learning based because it's robust. Uh, so there's quite a bit of optimization because we are taking in RTSP speed. Uh, we try to do things uh, asynchronously. Uh, we use PyTorch. The reason why we use PyTorch is uh, that's our favorite uh, deep learning framework. And uh, of all the three model, uh, three models, we actually uh, retrain with uh, data augmentation. So, reason why we the need for retraining is because uh, usually CCTV is often distorted. So, uh, we, we have to distort the picture and retrain to make sure that uh, the model is more robust uh, compared to what you see in your uh, the usual uh, Coco data set or your image net, they are all usually frontal perfect. So we, we do need to make this type of adjustment. So next slide. Uh, Dylan, sorry, uh, time check, there's two more minutes. Sure. Then we can well, take you Thank you. Sure. So I will quickly uh, run through. So uh, for this is the middleware. So middleware, you just do a coordination. There's a middleware. Input come in, then you will go out to the gantry, the display, and the database. So uh, if you can see the uh, below, Actually, we, we do have great help from our vendor. So they actually modified the gantry. Uh, uh, we, uh, we work together to modify the gantry so that it can be, uh, we can talk to the gantry via Bluetooth. So reason being uh, why we want it to talk to the Bluetooth uh, is because of the, the, rep, the ease of prototyping as well as uh, we, are, we were actually looking beyond gantry. So next time being that talk, it will be probably easier if we have a Bluetooth relay. Next slide. So, uh, so this is from the lab uh, to, the, to the vendor. So we, we tested in our office, quickly go to the vendor. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yep, so, uh, so to put, uh, sorry, before that. So uh, actually to, so we do have a prototype, but uh, what is more important is actually we bring the prototype to the field to do testing. Okay, so, uh, so hence, right, uh, for, for what we believe in, to make a uh, vigilant gantry a success, it's not just a gas tech. We need an industry partner. We also need an agency partner to give us uh, a place to be, to be deployed. So next slide. Hence, uh, we were very lucky that uh, NUS uh, allows us to uh, partner with us, uh, the vigilant gantry team, to deploy vigilant gantry for a high volume screening at their NUS library. So over a two weeks period. So, uh, so these are some of the key outcomes that we have. Uh, so over the two weeks period, each day there are about 1,000 visitors going past the vigilant gantry. So we are using this data, we are, we are able to calibrate, do a quite a bit of calibration. Uh, in addition to that, we also did uh, extensive survey. So uh, people are actually are quite satisfied uh, with the, the performance because they feel nothing, they just uh, go past. And the average waiting time is about two seconds per waiting time, which is about the same time when you tap. If you have a card, you have to tap, it's about two seconds. So we concluded that Visual Link Gantry was able to conduct a fever screening for a large number of people without increasing manpower. As what well, NUS was. Next slide. Yep, so this is the floor plan. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, the things that we are using is literally off the shelf. Uh, you can buy it in online anywhere. Next slide. Yeah, so uh so uh so uh we did we did actually 
the greatest thing that we learn, I mean, the most important things that we learn is actually uh, optimization. So, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I see people, uh, some person, uh, I saw this, this form, uh, looking through the gantry, run by run, I was laughing at him. So, uh, actually, two years later, I'm also doing the same. Uh. So, uh, I, I think it's important to, to really uh, make sure that your, is robust, your system is robust. Next slide. Yep, so, uh, so these are just quick uh, picture, uh, illustration of the model. Next slide. Yep, so uh, phase segmentation, uh, we are able to take the, take the data back and actually uh, calculate like the throughput, the accuracy. Happy to announce that uh, actually our system is really, really robust. Next slide. So uh, key learning points, uh, I think we perform well in terms of throughput rate. So as a person, you don't need to wait 40 minutes outside the hot sun, uh, yet you can get a good, uh, uh, accurate uh, screening. And also, uh, it's, we design it to be agnostic to different uh, uh, systems. So uh, even after the NUS, we actually deployed uh, quite a few places, and uh, all of them using different systems. Uh. So uh, what uh, suggestion that uh, we have from the ground that we talk to is, uh, Things like face indexing, logging of body temperature, dispenser of uh, stickers. Next slide. Yep, so that, that open source, uh, we actually open source the engine that do the state segmentation. So feel free to visit and contribute to this uh, GitHub repo. Yep, so this is the end of my uh, presentation. Next slide is uh, the end. So uh, thanks. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, if you can see in the Q&A chat, there are a few questions there. Uh, Maybe we can invite you to uh, pick one and uh, answer first. Yeah, sure. So I will uh, hold on. Uh, can you see it now? I can read it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, okay, so there's a question by uh, uh, Jessica, uh, Jessica Quack. Uh, so how do we buy and deploy our own uh, how do we buy and deploy at our own premise uh, office? How about safe entry still needed? So, uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, what what we have is actually uh, uh the whole idea of visual gantry, right, is to come up with a, a compelling business case uh, for the industry, right, to adopt, uh, and actually to to really deploy uh beyond what we can in GovTech. So, uh. So actually, if you can see, right, the things that we, we do have, uh, equipment that we use are literally off the shelf. Uh, so actually, the whole idea is to make sure that it's easily deployable. So, uh, but I think uh, you still have to work with the existing uh, building owners to do the deployment. Uh. So for integration with uh, Safe Entry, yes, we are actually talking to the team. Uh, actually, uh, I would say that it's one replaced another one. Uh, so for the circumstances that maybe uh, you cannot let a febrile person do fall through the crack, uh, a gantry is actually a more robust uh, way of saving it. Uh. So we, we are actually talking to them to integrate uh, the feature to our uh, next iteration of Vigilant Gantry. Thanks. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, do you want to just take one more? We have uh, one more. Okay. Now. One more, hold on. Okay, maybe I'll take the first. Uh... Okay, uh, so does uh, so Sante, uh, does it work in an environment with low lighting or uh, even consider infrared? So, uh, in terms of lighting, yes, quite a, a challenge, but uh, lucky for us, the place that we deploy are always at the lobby and, and because lobby is actually the place where you need uh, probably uh, some, something, uh, basically your security and to bear. So lucky for us, uh, the place that we deploy uh, Usually when gantry is something uh, quite brightly lit, so uh, we didn't face uh, too much issue uh, with that. Yep. Okay, thank you Dylan. Uh, so we have come to the end uh, of Vigilant Gantry Sharing. Uh, next, we'll invite Jezreel from URA to share about Space Up. Jezreel, please. Hi, so um, good evening everyone. Uh, I would like to thank GovTech for inviting URA to join today's sharing and uh, to have us to share on Space Out. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm the main engineer for Space Out, and uh, a little background of myself is um, I graduated from Nanyang Poly and studied information technology, and uh, that's where I started my coding and uh, learned different technology, and also specialized in uh, geospatial mobile, where I decided to start a career in this industry. Um, 
I move on to get my degree in information systems in SMU, and that's where I learned different set of skills and managed to publish my first uh, GIS research paper. And I'm still looking for opportunity to do my research while uh, having my day job. So, uh, so after my gra um, graduation, I started uh, working in URI. Uh, for about a year now. Uh, so among my projects, um, Space Out is uh, one of them. Uh, so you can hear me, get, right? Uh, so um, next, um, I will talk about um, how we start Space Out uh, and some of the design concept um, and application overview. And I will end off with um, some feedback and learning points. Uh, yeah, next. Yeah, so the safe distancing uh, measures was enhanced on 27 March uh, to control malls uh, crop level where many malls find it challenging to manage the crops at the entrance. Uh, we also see people facing long queues uh, when they arrive at the mall. Uh, and we do observe some malls doing manual counting, um, but then this information is not available to the public. So that's why we started Space Out to allow people to get the latest and recent trends of the crowd levels at most. Um, so that um, to enable them to make informed decisions before heading out to the mall. So we hope to facilitate a more even crowd distribution across malls and ease the mall operations in managing the long queues. Um, so next, so um, we're not sure where to start. So we look at large retail malls. Um, as we work with them, we realize um, every mall use uh, different technology and we also have to reach out to service partners for data information that we wanted. So uh, we managed to convince the malls that uh, the data will be used for public use and agency operations, uh, which will help us during this COVID-19 situation. So uh, we also try our best to make it convenient for the malls to provide their data to us. Uh, we also address the mall operator's concern on what information will be stored and how it is um, presented on space out. Uh, we also have user testing with them um, before we launch. Uh, after we launched, we actually added um, new partners and amenities uh, such as supermarkets, um, NTUC, you know, Prime, Xinjiang, and uh, Post Office, uh, as well as um, markets from NEA. So, next. So, um, when we were brainstorming the design of Space Out, uh, we wanted it to be easy to use. Um, it has to be flexible and scalable as well. Uh, we decided um, on a web uh, map application. Um, hello. Uh, yes, yeah, we can so, hear you. Uh, so it, so that it can be accessed uh, easily accessed with any web browser. Yeah. So, uh, users do not need to install um additional application. Uh, yeah. So. We also want the information to be available at a glance uh, where users can easily find crowd level information of every outlet from the map. Um, yeah. So we also make the UI components um, to be modular. Uh, so we are able to include more outlets um, and different activities types progressively in a seamless way. Yeah, so next. Uh, so we started off in using traffic light color and using circles as the shape. Um, but after our first launch, we received some feedback on the readability for color blind. Um, it is hard for them to read. So we went on to a um, few rounds of redesign of the map, um, play with different color schemes and took in advice from the expert. Um, we decided to retain the color and change the symbols for each crop level category. Yeah, so in this way, we get to keep the color design that we wanted and still serve the user's needs. So um, another feedback is the operating hours for post office. 
uh, we do not want it to look cluttered, so we decide to use the collapse and expand view component. Uh, we design every possible view based on the data we receive. Uh, it could be a range of days or a single day, uh, and if that is extra information needed to be displayed, we have an extra label to display it. Yeah, so when we work with um, NEA, we have another round of um, design discussion on how we want to display the queue count on space out and um, other than just um, the crop level status. Yeah. So we do not want to break the consistency of the design. So we added a batch label to show the queue count outside of a particular market. Uh, yeah. um, next. So recently we added a new function, the nearby less crowded option uh, to give our user a list of nearby less crowded amenities uh, as well as the distance away from the selected amenities. Um, we also enable multi-language drop-down option to be more inclusive for the members of the public. Uh, yeah, next. Yeah, so here are some of the tools we use for UI design. Um, we use Material UI React components for faster and easier web development. Um, we design our prototype in a code sandbox for easy collaboration between uh, UI designer and the engineer. Uh, yeah. Next. Yeah, so this is our application overview. Um, we have our CICD pipeline to review and approach our codes to UAT and um, production. Um, we also have a separate data pipeline um, to pipe data into our database. Uh, we have a uh, caching service in the front end as well. Uh, so next. Can you click to yeah. um, Okay, we use uh, commercial cloud services to enable us um, to scale up or down services quickly when needed. Uh, we separate the web map from the data pipeline so to prevent exposing the endpoints of the source system. Um, we store and fuse the data. Um, we collect into the database so to sort and um, mask the data to display it in space out um, as well as generating the trend analysis. So yeah, lastly we adopt various um, data engineering solutions to cater to every uh, operator needs. Yeah, uh, next. So yeah, I will give uh, more details on our data pipeline. We have automated scheduler to pull data uh, and we will do data processing to integrate the data and pipe to our cloud, uh, cloud document services, which will then do further uh, formatting and pipe into our database. Uh, we have also API provided by GovTech and other operators, uh, which we will also do data cleaning and formatting, and then we will then pipe to our database. So we also have bot services to pipe data strictly in, into our database as well. Uh, yeah. So some of the challenges um, we have, we face that's uh, one of which is the integration of different technologies. Um, as we receive like data in different ways and format, we need to find like the best solution to fit all and uh, integrate them into one. Um, and we also spend quite a lot of time in data cleaning and formatting. Uh, the next point. Yeah. Uh, so it could. Uh, we need to really clean the data and format it so that it could pipe into our database pro um, programmatically. Yeah. So we also face um challenges in doing user testing um, as data is kind of time sensitive where we need to do the testing at different timing to cover all possible scenarios. Uh, yeah. uh, so we receive, um, since the launch, we receive lots of um, feedback and suggestions. Um, and in particular, the visually impact intervals, individuals we are actually um, still trying to design our application to be more user-friendly to them. Um, so if you guys have any suggestions or ideas on how we could do better, do give us um, some suggestions in the chat and uh, we will try to make uh, do our best and make it happen. Uh, yeah, so next. 
Oh, so, so here are some of our learning points um, from our non-engineers colleague as well. Um, so we learned that we could leverage on technology and um, data to um, provide information for people to make informed decisions. We also able to work together to harmonize data among stakeholders. Uh, we learned to create alignment of interests with our operators and users and demonstrate feasibility and value. So we also learn to prioritize user journey, so to design a better application for uh, the members of public. And uh, we, we design and develop upfront to do improvements um, without disturbing user experience. And lastly, we uh, do gain uh, a deeper and, uh, appreciation of the technology we use as well. And uh, the, that's um, all we have. Um, thank you for listening. Hey, thank you, Jezreel. Uh, there are a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, maybe I'll read out the first one to you that's been upvoted. So how is the crop level calculated in space out? Yeah, um, so I will take a, the more as an example. Um, so the more operator actually determines um, what is their max occupancy uh, according to uh, Enterprise Singapore's um, one person to 16 square meter safe distancing guide uh, for retail malls. Um, and in, on space out, we have the colored and shaped tiers on um, uh, showing the percentage of the uh, mall that's built uh, based on each uh, mall's uh, maximum uh, occupancy. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so there's one more question from Inkyet. So when we look at space out and by the time we reach the mall, a place might have been overcrowded. Uh, are there any ways to take into consideration the action taken by the viewer, such as whether the person is going to a mall and then provide some projected views? Ah, uh, so this is more like um trying to uh, predict the the in a in a future where uh, uh, in thirty minutes time um where the place will be very crowded. So um right now we are actually um taking the data um straight from our operator. Um, we part the data from what the operators give us and also from um, many different sources. So it's, the, the frequency is really based on what the um, operator provide us. So we do not actually um, predict uh, in the next few uh, minutes what, what will be the rate, but to really give like what was last updated um, that we have um, in space out. Okay, thank you, Jesu. Uh, so there's one more question you can take from Shelley. Oh, so I will be picking on. Can you see? If not, I can read it out. Oh yeah. Um. Mm. So I can now uh, pick one from from it. So I. Uh, how are the um, I, I saw one. How how do the more how do the more operators calculate yeah. crowd levels? Um. So so yeah. So like um. I think I mentioned it previously that the uh, most of the malls actually um give us uh provide us uh, their maximum occupancy based on like the their floor plan area and also ESGs um one person to sixteen square meter. Um. So from that then we actually use what they uh the more provide their uh, current occupancy over like the maximum occupancy that is calculated based on ESG's guideline. So that's how we calculate um the crop out uh, that's how the more actually gave us um their crop levels. Uh. Yeah. Uh, would you like to take one more question? If not we can go to Chin and Xiaoli first. Uh, yeah, so perhaps I'll just take the last one. Like, okay. um, maybe can we have a um, feedback button because sometimes it's not accurate. Um, so, so 
we actually do have a email um, that we put out on case out that you can actually um, give us feedback on. And uh, we are actually working our best with the operators to provide as um, accurate um, data as possible that we can, yeah. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, so you have answered the question, right? How do you know how many people in the mall, whether it's manual? Okay. Okay. Can. So thank you everyone uh, for the questions for Jezreel. We will have uh, we'll address more questions later in the combined Q&A. So if I may invite uh, Chin as well as Jia Yi now from our Smart Nation uh, platform solutions to share about Spot the Dog. Chin and Jia Yi, over to you. Thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, good evening to all of you. I'm excited to share about what we've been working on this thing called Spot. Um, it's actually a mechanized um, dog like look alike uh, robot and so we'll talk a little bit about the genesis of how this all started um, our team uh, is essentially working on sensor platform and we are collecting data from sensors so that we can analyze it and then based on the data we make sense of what's happening and one of the aspects of sensors is we most of us think of sensors as being um, confined to a static environment. So when we thought about expanding out into other platforms, uh, natural consideration was, well, robots are made out of a whole bunch of sensors. And it would be wonderful if we could take those sensors that are on robots and then we can feed it back into our uh, data lake or be able to bring in information that otherwise in a static environment, which only picks up at certain points uh, by using a more agile or flexible platform, we perhaps can get more uh, sensor data. And so that's where the whole idea of looking out for a robot that is packed full of sensors that we can bring in data. And one of the uh, evaluation process was we looked at on paper a few types of robots and we considered all the different parameters that we think make sense for us and then we Pick spot because it came across as the right platform with the four-legged capability to manage all terrain. And with this, it has its secret sauce, which uh, the Boston Dynamics team built, is that it has a very stable an ability to have a very stable uh, body uh, with relation to where it is uh, orientated. And it also has over the 10 plus years of development, the different safety procedures they have put in place, like anti-collision and so on. So with this rich um, SDK and his rich APIs, uh, as well as a robust physical platform, we were able to then pick it to do some of the ambitions or missions that we want to set it up to do. My colleague CIE will deep dive into the technical bits, uh, but ultimately, what we want SPOT to do is not so much uh, that we see it as a fun little robot, but it has ability to give us a lot of um, ideas, a lot of opportunity to look into how sensors that are mobile, how do we create a robot area network, what kind of other sensors that we can put on it in which we can augment and create a rich environment for the data collection. And so I'll pass this to uh, Tia Yi, who will then deep dive into the details of Spot. Thank you, Chin. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending uh, StackX. It means a lot to us. All right, so I'll start. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. OK, so a bit of a background. So our team is a very small team, six people, including myself. Uh, we do robotics and smart systems. Uh, Spot is, well, the start of the show for tonight. But we also do other things as well. Uh, we gave a talk about Spot On uh, a couple of weeks ago. That's our um, deep learning based AI temperature scanning solution. We are part of the Smart Nation platform services. And um, just a bit of trivia the dogs arrived on the 8th of October 2019 last year. Okay, next. 
Uh, so I'm Jia Yi. Um, I this is just some of the background. I spent ten, year, ten years at Pixar as an R and D uh, simulation direct uh, technical director. I did mostly like physics simulation solver type stuff. So FEM, fluid dynamics, that sort of thing. Uh, and then after that, I did a bit of uh, deep learning and um, deployed the um, uh, part of the physics deep learning stack for the Samsung Galaxy line of phones. Uh, I returned to Singapore last year uh, after Chin um, graciously. Uh, you know, hosted me in the Bay Area <laughs> up to 20 years. So yeah, next. So, okay, let's talk about Spot. Uh, Spot at the core is, you know, four-legged, very nimble robot. Um, it is what we call a mobile sensor platform. But on top of it, we're building what we call uh, DOS, which is the Digital Operation Smart Services. And you'll see in a moment what it is. It essentially is our own robotics uh, sensor stack, which allows us to meet a, a huge diverse need, uh, you know, group of operational needs. And this is to serve the SNPS department. Next. So um, some information. Spot carries you know, a total payload of 15 kilograms. Uh, the batteries last about 90 minutes. It's got 360 degrees vision because it's got um, uh, cameras all around it, black and white though. Uh, it has built-in uh, inherent uh, collision avoidance, uh, and it can flip itself over when you actually. So the the reason why we do this is because when you fit the battery on the spot, it's on its belly, and so it flips itself over. So it's called self-right thing. Um, what's really cool about it is it can actually traverse over uneven terrains, so uh, and climb stairs. So this is something that wheeled robots cannot do. So that gives us, gives spot a huge mobility advantage. Next. So we have actually already been, um, you know, tr uh, uh, testing Spot in many places. Uh, we have actually tried it at places like JTC, uh, PUB, uh, and it, a lot of the use cases are for things like indoor three terrain mapping, building safety, health and safety infect inspection type type stuff, uh, situational awareness. Um, but you'll see in a moment what when when the, um, the COVID nineteen um, uh, pandemic hit. Uh, the the operation uh, operational requirements of Spot changed, and it became a very useful piece of equipment. Next. So again, uh, just repeat: it's a highly mobile robot. It's four legged. It can traverse um, uneven terrain. In fact, the lower uh, right image is uh, Spot traversing uh, an obstacle course uh, at I think the SEDF uh, obstacle course uh, place, where they actually have fallen buildings to simulate fallen buildings and and plane crashes. And we actually uh, piloted a dog over this sort of terrain, proving that it is um, a very robust for this sort of thing. Next. Okay, so before I dive into what we've done, I just want to say it's a general sensor platform. It's got an SDK, which is very um, very basic in functionality, but because of that, we can build our own robotics stack on top of it, which I'll start explaining. Uh, could we play the, um, the first video, the uh, spot present, please? So this will give you sort of a, um, yeah, so this video. So uh, these are some of the, uh, it's a bit choppy, but anyway, these are some of the, the things that you can do with spot. The first one is obviously climbing the stairs. That's a built-in ability, but this one is actually our own stack. So here we have a, a very simple deep neural network where spot is autonomously tracking and following a person. Um, and this is, this was actually done with a 5G thing. This is actually a full on 3D uh, point cloud. Well, actually more like a mesh created with our own stack. Uh, this is done with no LIDAR with a single camera. And these are so uh, these are all capabilities we've actually added to this robotics platform. Um, next, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so we have actually been deploying Spot in a couple of places. One of them is the um, Changi Exhibition Center. Uh, here, Spot is actually used to deliver critical medical supplies from the green zone into the red zone. Um, the reason why we do this is because it actually takes quite a bit of time to put on your PPE, your safety uh, equipment and attire and go into the red zone. And then the problem is ex exacerbated by the fact that if you're very tired, it's like 3 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning, um, you could make a mistake. And that will result in, you know, possibly infection or something else, right? So this reduces the, um, the exposure of our medical personnel to, um, to all the dan dangerous pathogens in the red zone. Uh, and in, in general, it's also traversing a very long distance. So also, also you know, reduces the manpower. And so I think it's a good thing, increases uh, uh, safety in those places. Next. Uh, it's just a setup. Uh, it's a very basic setup. We actually have more setups. So this like the first few setups where we actually put, you know, basically a thing on spot and it 
walked all the way into the, the red zone. Next. The other place I'm sure you've seen Spot being deployed is at the Bishan Amokyo Park, right? And so uh, can we play the video of uh, Spot Crowd, please? So I, I thought I would just share a very, it's kind of a interesting or funny video. Yeah, so here is, um, is it moving. Here's Spot actually, um, oh, I think the video is um, not very uh, fluid right now. Uh, it's not, it's not playing for me. Okay. I guess it's very choppy, but anyway, we have, we have a bunch of kids and all that looking at the dog. Uh, what's interesting is, um, this, um, as I'll say in a moment, uh, we, so we built the stack atop of a uh, spot and this act is called the uh, BV loss stack. So this actually allows us to pilot the robot anywhere in Singapore, as long as you have a 4G or 5G connection. So we actually piloted this dog, um, over four kilometers from the, um, the, the air conditioned office of MParks. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. We can stop the video. All right, so let's talk about our robotic control stack. Uh, we have a thin Python layer because the base Boston Dynamics SDK is in Python, but actually their core is also C++. We care a lot about performance and latency uh, and all the sorts of things uh, in our department because we're doing robotics and robotics is about um, all those things, right? So we use C++ 14 or 17 as a control layer. Why do we pick modern C++? Uh, the reason is because modern C++, uh, first of all, C++ is very performant. Secondly, um, C++ has the concept of what you call zero cost abstraction, right? So you only pay for what you want to do. And then modern C++ has stuff like smart pointers, uh, move semantics, lambdas, um, futures, all the cool stuff you expect from a modern programming language. But it also has the, the, you know, the, the high performance uh, benefits of C++. So we sort of get the best of both worlds if you know what you're doing. Uh, a lot of our code is actually uh, run in a native uh, custom game engine client with OpenGL and Vulkan backends. So you can sort of switch between uh, sort of like a more traditional, modern OpenGL thing or a, a more recent state-of-the-art Vulkan thing. Uh, because we care about, again, performance and we want to reduce uh, bandwidth, uh, we use uh, message pack for uh, binary serialization and deserialization to send messages across the network. Now, again, this is not the only option. You can pick Google Prolobuffs, you can pick flat buffers, but we pick message pack just because, you know, it's very fast, lightweight, but also has very few dependencies. So when you build your C++ code, it's, it's great, uh, easy to build. Uh, we use web sockets for communication. That's sort of the TCP equivalent for, um, you know, modern day web, web type stuff. Why do we care about web? Uh, because um, we actually plan to build our C++ code base into WebAssembly so we can actually deploy a lot of our control systems on the browser in native code or sort of in a VM. <clears throat> uh, and that's kind of cool because that sort of widens the scale of the deployment. We can actually deploy like, even more machines out there. Next. So I want to talk about robotic control systems. Everyone knows about it. I'm sure you heard about ROS. Uh, ROS is the robotic operating system. Um, it's not actually an operating system. Uh, it's really a robotic control system, an IPC. It's really a bunch of IPC uh, nodes, um, you know, sort of chained together in a directed uh, like dependency graph. And each node in it actually controls maybe like a LiDAR or like a embedded system or maybe the motors of a robot. So that's ROS, um, very well established in the industry. Lots of people use it, especially in academia and small robotic startups, but that's not the only option out there. There's also a, a new uh, system called uh, NVIDIA's Isaac, which if you take a look at it, is actually um, very similar to ROS, but they rewrote everything, right? So it, it's very high performance uh, instead of the, you know, it has actually has uses Cap and Proto for message passing. So it's very performant. Uh, zero cost serialization actually, uh, also the same dependency graphs, but more crucially, Isaac is built into NVIDIA's uh, deep learning stack, which means that you can actually run a lot of neural networks in real time, uh, especially uh, the inf when I mean, I mean inference, of course, uh, in real time on the edge, which is important because today you cannot do robotics without machine learning in particular deep learning. So that's also Isaac. And lastly, there's also Boston Dynamics and many other robotics manufacturers don't use ROS or Isaac. They use what they call custom systems, whatever they want to roll, right? What are we talking about this? The reason why I'm talking about this is because we build our robotics control stack with the consideration that um, there are different robotic control systems out there and we cannot satisfy everyone, which means that we have to be robotic system agnostic. So our code is designed to be easily embeddable to any of those systems. In fact, we have various autonomy systems. One of them is running on ROS, one of them is running on Isaac, 
And then, of course, the core controller is running on Boston Dynamics. So actually, our core system doesn't care what robotic system you have. We've designed it in such a way to be agnostic. Next. OK, so let's talk about the first feature, Beyond Visual Line of Sight, BV Loss. Uh, what it allows you to do is pilot the robot anywhere in Singapore with a 4G or 5G connection. We've done a lot of uh, quality of service optimization. So it actually runs in areas of really bad comms. In fact, at end parks, there were places where it was less than a bar and we could still pilot the dog gracefully. Uh, it streams in real time, of course, all of Spot's cameras into the game engine layer and render in real time. It's a bit like a car. So when you pilot it, it's like a game, like a first person shooter game. But when you say you, 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 you go backwards, the backwards, ca backwards camera actually you know, turns on. So it shows you the blind spot. If you turn left, it shows the left and right. So it's a bit like, car, like a car. And just like a car, uh, we've added cruise control as well and other niceties. Uh, you pilot it with a, with a joystick. Um, and we've proven this works uh, in many places, including Bishan Amakyo Park, where it's driven over four kilometers from an air-conditioned office. So uh, BV loss in vastly increases the oper operational range and capabilities of spot. We can sit anywhere, sorry, we can, we can pilot the dog anywhere uh, around the island as long as we have a you know, relatively, relatively good 4G and 5G connection. Next. Okay, so here is sort of the setup. This is at CEC, actually, a real, real world scenario, right? So on the left, you see the doctors and nurses. Um, that's our game engine client. They're piloting with a joystick on the right. You can see Spot actually traversing through CEC. Uh, so on the left, they're actually, tra they're actually, I think, part of the Raffles Medical Group in the offices. And on the right, this is actually going through the uh, quarantine center. Next. Okay, <clears throat> so once you can move the dock, the next thing you want to do is actually put sensors on it, right? So we have added a lot of uh, different sensors solutions onto the dog now obviously these days everything's deep learning based so we also deep learning based we have real-time crowd estimation we have real-time interperson distance estimation so we can actually estimate um, through tr uh, combination of neural networks and computer vision we can actually estimate the distance distances between two individuals for social distancing uh, we have face mask detection detection and uh, crucially all of these features are rolled into our um, automated uh, sensor system so in other words what happens is the mpox officer just has to pilot the dog and the dog will just look at the scene and then infer and decide what to do so it can it can it can automatically infer if there's too many people if people are too close or people are not wearing face masks and and then it can then say choose to do an appropriate action automatically like broadcast a certain safety message so that the whole thing is automated the only thing the the operator needs to do is to pilot the dog. And even then we're trying to automate that as well. So crucially, all our deep uh, neural network models run inference on the edge in C++ in real time on CUDA. Um, that's what we really care about in this group. Next. Okay, so here's some uh, examples. <clears throat> uh, on the left, you, you, you see basically uh, our solution spot on. Why am I showing spot on? Because spot on was actually developed as part of the sensor payload for spot. It was actually part of our robotic system, our robotic control stack. So when I said, I mentioned our robotic control stack is very flexible and very generic, not only do we support Ross and Isaac and Custom, we actually do, any, we do everything else as well. We can take a mobile sensor, a mobile uh, AI thermal scanning solution, and actually augment it and make it a static, real-time uh, AI thermal scanning solution, and we can put it back on the dock. So on the left, we actually show a real-time face AI scanning solution, temperature per face in real-time, 10 or even 15 faces at once. This is the capability we have. On the right, we have our face mask detection, uh, a, a new thing that we worked on, our machine learning, learning engineer has done. And uh, why do, so you can notice on the right, the video quality is not very high. This is on purpose. It actually shows uh, that our system can detect, even under bad uh, bandwidth and bad video uh, quality conditions, whether you're wearing a face mask or not. In fact, in the lower right, you see the guy is not actually wearing a face mask and we've actually, uh, properly, sorry, and we've actually detected that with a 0 0.98 confidence. Um, so that's pretty cool. Next. Okay, so the other thing we have is um, dense 3D reconstruction uh, from cameras. So we we can reconstruct a 3D environment uh, of, of what Spot sees. This is a pure perception-based technique. Uh, we use Intel RealSense cameras. You don't have to use it, but that's what I'm using. So uh, a couple of interesting things about it. We, we take you know, what we, we, we get from those images, and then we basically um, put it in, integrate that into a, a truncated sign distance, form, a distance field. Uh, if you sort of remember, a sign distance field is basically um, a, a different representation for um, for, for geometry, right? So instead of having polygons, you can actually sort of 
construct a, a, a sine distance function, which sort of, if you sample from a point in three space, it'll tell you exactly the closest distance from that point to the point on the surface. And the surface, um, anything on the surface has zero distance. That's sort of called the interface. So a truncated sine distance field has the advantages of a sine distance field, but also is truncated. So it has a lot of memory benefits because you only uh, store values you care about. It's a bit more sort of more sparse. If that's a word for it. Uh, we use that because this actually allows us to um, construct the, the 3D environment uh, in a very detailed way and then we can downsample if it's too dense. So it saves some memory, so it, it helps us in terms of performance. Uh, we can also easily triangulate it back with some algorithms like you know, regular stuff in marching queue. So it's very easy to, to do that sort of thing. You can import it into Maya, for example. Next. So here are some examples. You saw the videos before. Uh, and so on the left and right, this is just the office. Uh, again, this is done with no LiDAR, uh, just with a single RGBD camera. So this is sort of the capability we've also built uh, into Spot. Uh, next. So lastly, I want to talk about autonomy. Um, we are actively working on autonomy. I think that's, this is a, a big area we're really passionate about. Um, the crucial thing that the autonomy, the, the, the autonomy thing that we're working on Spot is quite different from um, anything else out there like indoor autonomy. We're, we're actually trying to work on large scale outdoors autonomy and that's a really difficult problem. So we're, we're you know, we have implemented and tried out different approaches. We have uh, traditional LiDAR stand based techniques. We also have uh, perception based techniques, but also we're looking increasingly into more state of the art uh, deep learning based approaches. Now we're working with we're pilot, piloting a dog over unstructured terrain. So we're not talking about office autonomy. We're doing something uh, much uh, larger scale. Next. So uh, can we play the video of uh, spot BD autonomy, please? Okay, so this is a um, uh, perception-based technique. This is already integrated into our um, robotics uh, BB loss stack. So you see here, um, Spot is actually navigating, well, this is the office, so this is a test, <laughs> but this is purely based off uh, perception. So there is no LiDAR involved. Uh, and um, <clears throat> what I've done is you sort of record a route for the dog to move, that's the route, and then it sort of you know, traverses the path that you, 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 you moved about. Uh, can we jump to the, uh, the, the, the uh, center of the, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so yeah, and then I get up and then just to show its autonomy, <laughs> I get up and then I film the dog, the dog comes over and then I follow, follow the dog. Uh, again, no LiDAR, um, empty payload. Uh, and you can see it's, it's moving around uh, the office and it makes a left into uh, the other um, chairs and all that. So anyway, so this is um, the first method we have. That's already integrated into our stack. Uh, perception based. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, sorry, can we go to the uh, the next video, the uh, MPARC autonomy? So, yeah, can we play the MPARC autonomy? Yeah, so then we also have more traditional um, LiDAR based autonomy techniques as well. This is uh, based off a particle filter. Uh, and um, can we jump to the, cent the middle of the, the video, please? Thank you. Um, and um, it's a very challenging thing to do, but we've actually managed to actually do it. We've actually aut autonomously walked around uh, a, well, a small loop, but still a very challenging loop of M parks. Um, so why are we doing all this, right? Uh, obviously, this is one of the biggest uh, feature requests by all the agencies. They want the dog to be autonomous. So that's why we're working really hard on autonomy. And why are we trying out all these techniques? Because in autonomy, um, I believe that we had to be have redundant solutions. So we need to have multiple ways of uh, autonomously piloting the dog for safety reasons and also for robustness. Yeah. So here's the um, MPARC's autonomy. Okay. So Sorry, quick time check. Uh, yes. There's uh, one more minute to Okay, no worries. Okay, okay, we can stop this. We can stop this video immediately. Yeah. Can we go back to the slides, please? I think we're almost done. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I'm done. That's all we have. Okay. In good time. Um, so yeah, there's a few questions uh, that's typed into the Q&A. Would you like to look through or there's one at you, the top? How about you just pick them? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so Jessica's uh, asking, she's wondering if Spot the Dog is going to be around the parks as a social distancing announcer, uh, whether people will get used to it as a machine and soon ignore it soon. Is there a calculation on the effectiveness of this use? Um, to be honest, I think we have only, we, MPARCs, has officially said we're going to start sort of um, 
more like a deployment thing uh, next week. So we'll find out. It's a very good question. I will be very curious myself. <laughs> uh, but so far, it seems to work. But again, you know, I, 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 I think we need more, more testing. Um, I want to jump in here. Uh, this is Chin. I want to jump in here because I like Jessica's question. Um, if people get used to it, that's actually our goal, right? Uh, we don't want people to be frightened of it. Uh, and why the PUX is because it is an opportunity to test our autonomous algorithm. So that's the uh, two pluses for us, right? That we want people to get used to it. And then we have an area that is uh, difficult to actually recognize features. If you look at an office, you've got a lot of objects in which the vision system can uh, pinpoint to. But if you look at an open system, so Jiayi has been talking about the difficulty in open spaces. The, the reason is because open spaces all look alike. And if we are, and this is without using GPS, right? It's not that there is GPS aid. So that using essentially the visual system that's on the robot to be able to find and identify where it is and then to be able to take itself to its end goal. So that's, that's where uh, the NPAX project come in handy. And of course, uh, social distancing is not going to be around forever. At some point, COVID will end uh, and there will be more users for it. So the ability for the sensor or visual system to look at uh, whether the furniture is damaged or what kind of uh, trash is around will be the other use cases for parks. Imagine if spot is now where people are very used to it, it's going to take a 35 kilometer hike up the PCN, right? Because then you have another mission for it to do. So, so I like that question. And yes, we, we have in mind more use cases for it. Thank you, Chen. Uh, so there's one more question for Spot. Uh, what kind of strange situations have you observed over the past weeks of deployment? Uh, example, people try and mess with them and how has Spot responded to these situations? Um, so to be honest, um, I think most people are very curious about the dog. So when a dog walks around, you have tons of people using your phones and all that to take photos. Uh, and um, and Parks was a bit concerned about it, and I, I think I would be because you're talking about social distancing. But the great thing about it is um, because Spot is off-road, so what, what ended up happening is we started deploying Spot off the path. So in a lot of places, people couldn't traverse, so we can actually do proper um, monitoring. Uh, so I don't think there was, it was any impact, to be honest. I think it was actually quite good, uh, thanks to the fact that we have the BV loss system and the fact that the, the dog is altering. So I just want to add also a couple of points uh, to what Xiaoyi said. Uh, safety is at the top of our priority. So when we deployed this as a trial, um, spot while it is controlled from a be, uh, beyond visual line of sight, there's actually a park, uh, end parks person uh, walking next to it. Uh, that's also to answer the question if somebody want to steal it. Uh, right there that's not a silly question we, we have thought we actually ran through a, a list of about i think 15 things what if people want to do a graffiti or people want to kick it and pour all kinds of stuff on it and so on so i think what put it this way if somebody want to steal spot you have to be pretty strong to carry 30 kilos on your back then you have to figure out how to charge it if, I mean, what else can it do, right? The whole point of um, where uh, Tia Yi was talking about building a robot ubiquitous platform is actually, we are using that platform to also control beyond some of the HTX where they use aerobotics for drones. Uh, actually, we have also used that system to power robotics for use. So using the same, uh, uh, code base and then we are also looking at other um, robotic system so the point that I'm trying to make is we are not uh, developing the platform for spot uh, because spot is cute and fun such that there is a robotic platform that is ubiquitous for others uh, so they don't have to build everything from scratch and so that's one of the contribution from GovTech to the industry and to our 
agencies. And ultimately, um, just for, for the rest of you who may be curious, uh, we get all kinds of funny comments about sport being scary and so on. So we love to figure out with you what kind of costume, what kind of facade, what kind of thing you can 3D print that we can slap onto sport to make sport a little more cute, right? Maybe we can make it into a walking lion, who knows? So we are open for ideas for this and want to make, uh, as Jessica pointed out, uh, that people will look at it and not bat another eye and say, well, this is normal stuff. That would, would be a dream come true for us. Okay, thank you, Chin and I tell you. Uh, there's one question from Ignatius about the operational time before it requires charging. Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, it really depends on uh, how we separate the sensor payload from. So in our testing with, at the CEC, uh, the Changi Exhibition Center, uh, we actually ran spot for, for almost three hours. Uh, the reason we could do that is because we focus on spot battery to run spot. We actually had an external battery to run the sensor payload. So that by splitting the sensor payload power consumption with spot, we were actually able to then utilize spot for a longer period. Now, the, the reason uh, we didn't want to plug into the spot power supply in uh, I was told that actually it will be able to handle it is simply because the sensor system uh, with its own juice uh, that is grabbing from so that we can differentiate between what power is required just to do spot for walking and doing its, its other amazing things uh, versus from a sensor payload so that we can actually differentiate and do energy or battery budgeting uh, when we put future sensor payloads. Okay. Thank you, Chen. Uh, so now uh, we'd like to move on to the combined Q&A uh, session. Uh, maybe uh, if you all have further questions, please type them into Q&A. Uh, maybe the first one, uh, I'll address it to uh, Jezreel. Uh, Shelley has a question about whether there's trends in the used rates of space out and uh, where and how the team is encouraging Singaporeans to use space out before going out. And if the team did user research to see how it can be embedded into a uh, citizen's going out journey. Uh, yeah. uh, so I, I see that question in two parts and I will answer in um, at digital ship and user journey. So we do analyze our uh, use rate on space out um, and we do have about um, 20,000 um, daily user since the launch. Um, we also developed the space out in about a week. Um, designing in a very short time, we actually do ask our colleagues, um, like the members of the public as well, like whom also have to go for um, essential retail needs. Um, so we ask them and they find it um, useful to uh, find out the crowd level before going out. And if it's um, very crowded now or around this time, uh, then maybe we should uh, go another time or somewhere else less crowded. So as for like awareness, um, we introduced um, Space Out through all our mainstream uh, and social media channels. Uh, and so also some of our partners also share through their channel as well. So uh, yep. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, there's one question for uh, Dylan about whether besides NUS Library, have you deployed Vigilant Gantry uh, in other sites? And are there different challenges to each of the sites that you have uh, deployed Vigilant Gantry to? Yeah, uh, so other than NUS, uh, we have deployed in uh, three other places, including one uh, higher institute higher learning institute, uh, one semi-outdoor condition. So, uh, so this site, actually the challenges is a lot to do with the field of view of the cameras. So uh, I think related to another, pro another question is about the accuracy. So uh, what our metric is, is actually uh, how fast can we do proper uh, temperature screening as well as the face segmentation within a certain period. So what we give ourselves is uh, two seconds. So, uh, I would say that 90%, more than 90% of uh, the screening, uh, accurate screening can be done uh, within uh, 90%. But this is subject to the site challenges. Uh, I think site challenges, does, site challenges does play quite a bit. So for example, sometimes your camera uh, 
due to the type constraint, you, you cannot put actually directly, you have to put quite quite high. So uh, these are the challenges that we face. So hence, uh, uh, there's actually a, quite a bit of uh, trial and error and customization to be made uh, in every site for now. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dylan. Uh, so there's one question by Kane, uh, which I think is relevant to all three projects. Uh, maybe uh, Chin and Xiaoyi can start first. Uh, the question is about what's the privacy policy behind all these data collected uh, through your various uh, solutions. Uh, Chin, you want to answer so that I'll question? start with Spot, perhaps. Um, so, um, Spot, uh, as a matter of rule, uh, we do not make any of the data personally, uh, personable and, and, and identifiable. So what that basically means is that we take the information, uh, but we don't put it to a person. Uh, the second part about it is besides that it has an encryption and so on and so forth, uh, and that is difficult to extract the data without special access, um, what I think is also important is the mission that we use it for. And most, in this particular case, when you're thinking about COVID, uh, there are better solutions uh, besides SPOT in this particular case that can do the job. So you, I would say that for the, uh, from a SPOT perspective, we, we are quite niche and narrow in how we use it for the COVID uh, social or safe distancing. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Jezreel or Dylan, would you like to share? Uh, so for, for visual and gantry, at least for the inference, uh, we, don't, we don't have any uh, data, even though we do face detection. Uh, every time a detection is made, uh, the data is discarded. So uh, we, do, we do not face any uh, face information. Uh, for the training, uh, for training purposes, we use uh, open, open data, uh, readily available uh, to the public. Okay. Yeah, so for space out, um, we do not collect any personal data. Um, we actually took the data from um, the malls and other um, APIs. Um, and for this, for this count, uh, you can actually identify um, uh, any individual, but the mall do have concern on their actual mall occupancy. Um, so we actually mask the data that we receive and then uh, we display on the space out. So we do mask them so um, there won't be any of this uh, concern. Okay, thank you, Jezreel. Uh, I see from the participants, uh, Pui Leng has uh, raised hands. Uh, Pui Leng, if we can invite you to uh, ask your questions. I think you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Pwiling. Uh, Alex, could you unmute Pwiling? Yeah, uh, Pwiling, could you unmute yourself and uh, can ask the question? Okay, uh, I think maybe she's having some issues. Maybe I'll go to the... Uh, hello, Pwiling? I think Sorry, I accidentally clicked on the button. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, no problem. Uh, okay, maybe we can just uh, go to the Q and A uh, questions. So I think at uh, this question, I'm not sure whether it's for Jezreel or for Dylan. Maybe one of you would like to take it. Uh, they asked about the sampling, if there's any false negatives and if it's possible to have zero false negative detections. Should be for Dylan. Yes, I think uh, it's fine. So, um, yeah, so the answer is, uh, so even though we are using a robust method of uh, using deep neural net, so it's never perfect. Uh, so it's quite impossible to have a zero false detection, a zero uh, false positive. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So maybe I'll go to the next question. Uh, the accuracy rate, I think this for Dylan as well. Uh, what are some of the limitations and accuracy rate of your solution? Yeah, 
So, uh, so what we are doing is actually quite uh, well established uh, detection of face. So, uh, accuracy rate is uh, uh, probably as good as what a human can see. Uh, limitation of the solution is a very good question. So, uh, being like, uh, as, as why I put it, it's a hub. So, uh, you're integrating with a lot of uh, IOs and as well as sensors. So, sometimes you've got no control of uh, the accuracy of the particular sensor. So, for example, if it's the thermal camera is not well calibrated, uh, so we couldn't get a good reading. Uh, if you got a false reading, uh, obviously there's nothing our system can do. I think we have one last question here. Uh, whether GovTech is considering all these solutions to be open source uh, in future. I think Dylan shared that uh, Vigilant Entry has been open source, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe Jezreel and uh, Tia, you can share about your solutions. Um, so far, um, we have not um, decided to uh, do open source our solution. Um, as we have like security reasons, so I guess we 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 will perhaps think about it and um yeah um, and uh, yeah. So uh, I guess I'm not in the best position to like answer this as well. Jin, are we open sourcing or not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, the reason why I asked is because it's focused on the technical bits and I'm supposed to look at the strategy. The short answer today is that we're not going to open source it. The, the, the simple reason is because of um, two, I will just tell you two. Uh, if you're talking specifically right now about robotic system, uh, robotic system by itself, if not done properly, uh, proper, properly uh, will actually be dangerous, right? So it is very important, therefore, that we must put these management of robots in very capable hands and that we must always design it with security and zero trust from day one. And because we do this, uh, it implies therefore a lot of security for security reason. We don't want it to be hacked. We want it to make it such that there is no possible option for someone to use it to be uh, as a weapon. So that's the first point. The second point about uh, not open sourcing is because we are at a, at a very nascent state uh, to look at how we can build a robotic uh, solution. Uh, there are actually other solutions made available by government agencies. Uh, for example, the effort by IMBA, uh, where they are open sourcing their robotic fleet management. Uh, and that would allow for uh, SMEs as well as the industry who are interested in this space to use those open source for a specific generic mission. Our mission that we are looking at is very specific for government use. So with this uh, second point is therefore important that we focus on government uh, agencies as our customers and we keep it within the government for now. Uh, does it mean that we will forever keep it in government? I think that really depends on the maturity of the industry in Singapore, but we will certainly love to have our industry, robotic in industries in Singapore to be able to take on um, very tough projects and if they can do it, uh, it's all so much better for the country. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chin. Okay, uh, I think we need, uh, in the interest of time, we'll take uh, the last question. There was uh, one question about security in the design and whether the development team adopts a secure design development. Uh, so, Chin has answered, uh, addressed that in uh, his answer just now. Maybe I can invite uh, Jezreel, then Dylan, to answer this question. Um, so, our security and design um, comes in different uh, parts. So, uh, in terms of the data, we, we actually separate our data pipeline with our um, code so that it doesn't um, use it directly with our web application. We uh, have it as a separate pipeline and trait to our database, which um, it will um, not expose our endpoint. Um, as for our web application, we have firewalls, designs, uh, and all the necessary security measures with our inf infrastructure team. Um, so therefore, it's, we do our best to really uh, enhance the security measures for our applications. 
uh, as well as we also mask like uh, our data the front end to uh, prevent any sort of way to and to uh, see or calculate or and uh, analyze like the the data in the front so yeah So just uh, yeah, just a quick answer. Um, so uh, currently Visualize Gantry uh, runs everything locally. Uh, so we do have the basic uh, software hardening, uh, OS hardening uh, for all these layers to ensure security. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, uh, thank you all the speakers, uh, Dylan, Jezreel, Jiayi, and Chen, uh, for your sharing. Uh, we finished the combined Q&A session. Uh, we just have two more things to share with the participants. Uh, Alex, if you could bring on the slide on developer portal. Yeah, so uh, we'd just like to share with everyone that uh, on GovTech's developer portal, we'd like to invite you to come visit our portal. Uh, so in there, we share a lot of the products that uh, GovTech as well as Whole of Government has built. We'll increasingly be bringing on board uh, more products as we go along. Uh, and as mentioned, there's uh, access to documentation on this portal as well. And uh, after we finish this uh, webinar, we will be sharing the recording uh, through this developer portal. So you can visit us to find out more about some of the uh, blogs that's written by GovTech, uh, some of the community events recording that we will be posting on the developer portal. So you can uh, scan this QR code to learn a bit more. Uh, maybe you can go to the next slide. Uh, where I can invite my colleague Gina to share a bit more about uh, an upcoming event. Gina. Yep. Hi. Um, thanks, Dylan um, and um, Jasril, Jia and Chin for the interesting sharing. Hi, I'm Gina and I'm from the talent acquisition team, GovTech. So I'm sure all of you must be very inspired by what we do here for Public Good. I would like to take this opportunity to share that GovTech is, at, is actively hiring um, is actively looking out for good and experienced engineers to join us. Um, we are recruiting software engineers, cybersecurity specialists, data scientists, and all that. Name it, we have it. Um, these tech roles are important uh, to us when we build these digital solutions to support uh, COVID-19. So we have just launched um, our first tech hunt uh, last week for software engineers. Um, there are more lined up in, in the weeks to come, such as like cybersecurity on the 4th of um, June, followed by like data science and AI and all that. So here's the QR code. Um, we welcome interested applicants who believe in uh, tech for public good to join us. So uh, please share the QR code with your friends and register your interest or go to go.gov.sg slash tech hunt um, for more details. Okay, that's all we have. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Gina. Uh, if y'all could uh, register, so there's one uh, event coming up next week, uh, as well as more in the middle of June. Uh, Alex, we just go to the last slide. So I uh, would like to thank everyone for your time, uh, spending this time to join us in this webinar. Uh, it was very interesting and thank you for all the questions posed. Uh, if we could get some of your feedback uh, on how you found the webinar so that we can improve, uh, we appreciate if you can fill in the links here. So thank you everyone and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone who's uh, still around. If y'all would like to, uh, y'all have questions, you can uh, raise your hands and then we can turn our mics and uh, say hi to each other.
Uh, if anyone would like to talk, please raise your hands. Uh, the speakers are still behind and uh, we can take some questions. Okay, if not, good night everyone again. Oh, there's one hand raised. Uh, Bill, do you have a question? Uh, hi, yeah, I'm, my hi. name is... Uh, hi. Yeah. Thanks for the talk, everyone. Yeah. So, my name is Bill Pa. I'm just wondering, um, I'd like to ask Dylan on the visual analytics team. Yeah. So, like, yeah. what, what are some other projects that are in the lineup for, for the team? And, and what are other developments in terms of, um, like, specifically tackling COVID? Okay, uh, so uh, generally, uh, um, we have an engagement team uh, that goes around and uh, they will, they will tutor out this use case. Uh. So, uh, 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 so, I'll put it this way that, uh, I mean, like, uh, sometimes uh, agency has some use cases, uh, which I may not totally know everything, uh, so they'll come to us, uh, we, we actually do filtering. Uh, then, uh, we, the reason why we need to filter is we need to know whether actually uh, is, is it solvable by uh, using video analytics. So uh, we are more comfortable with doing things that are quite uh, mature. For example, uh, people counting, uh, social distancing, the, the use, use case that I think you see recently. Uh, sorry, my, my house is raining. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, so, so we, we prefer mature, uh, something that is mature rather than experimental. Uh. So things like people counting, uh, are uh, something that we, we are doing actually right now. So uh, right. uh I think it's yeah yeah I uh, is there like anything specific uh you you, you would uh, actually suggest uh, that we should be doing? Because I think these are uh, fantastic uh, opportunity for us to actually hear uh suggestion from the ground. Right, I guess I guess in the sense you are right that it's better to look at something that's more try and tested that actually works and I. I mean, off the bat, I'm also wondering whether in terms of deployment, whether like that testing on whether, say, several religious headgear will actually be a form of occlusion for the measure of temperatures or sure, at sure. this account. So, uh, yes, uh, so we, we do approach uh, uh, the Changi Airport group. So uh, they have a protocol. Uh, so, you know, people coming with uh, headgears uh, due to religi uh, religious, uh, so, so, uh, so, 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 from what we understand from the agency, the protocol is actually not to go through the thermal scanning system, but actually go somewhere uh, with privacy, use a the thermal gun and, and do it. Uh. So, so they, they, they are protocol that we actually follow for at least digital gantry when we deploy in NUS. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Inke has a question. Inke would like to speak as well. Yes, yes. I have a question for Dylan. Uh, I'm, I'm quite curious to know, if, uh, are there agencies, uh, other government agencies that may not have data scientists like yourself who wants to use a platform um, to train certain use cases um, to build their model so that um, they don't have to line up <laughs> to, to get help from the data scientists? I mean, are there plans to have like a platform to enable citizen data scientists uh, where there are business users who, who can find some easier way to train models and then uh, try to experiment um, at the ground? Uh, so yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we do have a product uh, under Active Development. It's called VDYO. So uh, we understand that uh, a lot of this use case uh, actually is not really sophisticated. Sometimes you just, uh, for example, you want to detect, uh, for example, you want to detect rats. So, uh, these are, are not really very difficult use case. So, uh, so my team is actually developing this uh, so software. Uh, they will be available in GCC. It's called VideoIO. Uh, uh, so basically, as, as what you mentioned, uh, pump in uh, your data. Uh, sometimes you have specific data that we can't collect. So you pump in, you train the model, and you output. So uh, currently, what we have is for um, for classi classification, image classi classification, uh, object detection, uh, which these two is actually the one of the most two most requested uh, services that we get uh, from agency. So uh, maybe we can uh, definitely talk uh, offline. Uh, we can maybe put my email in in, in the chat, and uh, we can actually I can link you up with the, the the product manager. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
I, I do have one more silly, it's a silly question, it's a fun question. I, I know this, this um, Boston Dynamics uh, spot is very interesting, but I'm just wondering, um, it's also not, it's pricey, like, I guess, one robot. Mm -hmm. I, I, are there plans to take the smarts that GovTech has built, uh, that put on top of the, uh, the spot, uh, and, and maybe, you know, <laughs> uh, put it in a very neat form where uh, humans can augment and carry out some of the data collection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, yeah, it's a fun question. Uh, just, just, uh, the, the, the robotics control stack that, um, that me and my team um, built is completely um, robotic system agnostic. So uh, we can actually take that and then retrofit it on um, any other robot, real robot, um, even like a mobile sensor. Mm. So in fact, actually, when I presented just now, right, you saw the autonomy thing. The, yeah. the different various autonomy systems and the BV lastly are running on three different separate control systems. So okay. there's nothing stopping us from actually just taking this and, and using it to, to pilot some other thing. It's not a problem. Ah, okay. okay. It was designed so from ground up to be right. agnostic. I see, I see. Okay, that's good to hear that. All yeah. right. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll bring the webinar to a close. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And again, thank you to all the speakers for all your sharing. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest. It's raining. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.